Listen. A sower went out to sow and some seed fell among the thorns. And the thorns rose up and choked out the plant. What thorns are surrounding you right now? What thorns are choking out your relationship with God? A relationship that says, I love you. I want you to be with me. I want you to be part of my community. A relationship where Jesus looks at a man surrounded by thorns, looks at him with love, and asks him to do the hardest thing ever. And the man chooses the thorns. Listen. A sower went out to sow. And some of the seed landed among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it out. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen. Listen, a sower went out to sow. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And he said, let anyone with ears to hear, listen. And others are those sown, sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word. And it yields nothing. And our second passage is from Mark 10, 17 to 20. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked, and he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. to think about and struggle with. In our scriptures today, in Jesus' parable, he says that there's some seed that falls among the thorns, and those thorns are the lure of wealth, the desire for possessions, that the cares of the world come and choke out the experience 
of God, of love. And Mary and Halbert argues that there are people that represent those thorns in our story from the Gospel of Mark. And she argues that those thorny people are the young man in our story this week. And Herod and Pilate. So let's take a look at that young man. What is it about the thorn that gets him? In the story, he comes up to Jesus with a question. How can I inherit eternal life? Now I want you to hear me say this to you. Because we are UCC, right? Jesus says that's not the right question, right? He doesn't answer that question. He changes the words of that question and says, how do you enter the kingdom of God? In other words, our obsession with what happens after we die isn't the question that Jesus wants you to struggle with. He wants you to struggle with the question of how do you enter the kingdom of God? How do you become part of God's kingdom? And so he says to the man, have you kept the commandments? And so as he's reciting the list of commandments, any of you have got them on your wall? Have them memorized from Sunday school? All right, he left out the first ones, right? All the ones that are about God and our relationship to God. And he, Jesus lists the ones that are about our relationship to each other, right? So the commandments he lists are, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. Now, in the list from Exodus and Deuteronomy, the next one would be, you should not covet another stuff. Mark changes that. So Mark is giving you a subtle clue about what is the young man's problem, right? He changes it from covet to a different section of commandment within the Levitical codes and says, you shall not defraud another. Meaning that Jesus, in seeing this wealthy man, believes that the wealth that he has gathered, he has gotten from a system that exploits others. That the wealth that he has gathered unto himself and has made his life good has been a product of a system that lets others' lives struggle because of that collection of wealth. And so Jesus put that in there to tell the man, I know what it is you're really struggling with, okay? I know the center of what is it that is keeping you from a deeper, stronger, better relationship with God. And so then it says, and I love this because it doesn't always say this in the gospel, right? It says he looks at that man and loves him. Loves him. Because that young man had said, I have kept all of these commands since my youth. So he denies that one of, of stealing from the poor, of defrauding the poor together as well. He denies that commandment says, I've kept them all. And you know what? From his perspective, he could have. Because the system was set up in such a way that he could gather all that wealth unto himself. That it was made for certain individuals to come in and scoop up all the wealth. So that others can't have it. And so, the system says he's doing the right thing. And in fact, the system celebrates him, right? Because we have over and over again, even to this day, we are told that if you are wealthy, you are blessed by God. That God has blessed you. And so he believes that he has done the right thing. 
And so then Jesus looks at him and loves him. He says, there's only one more thing you need. There's only one more thing you need to enter into the kingdom of God. There is one more thing. Go. Take everything you have and sell it and give it to the poor and come and follow me. If you want to enter the kingdom, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. In other words, that money that you had gotten from the poor, I want you to return it to them. I want that money to go back where it came from. And the man, the man at that moment, you know, he, he didn't, he couldn't hear those words. He didn't want to hear those words. And so grieving within his soul, he flees Jesus and the disciples. How do we deal with the question of wealth? And when does wealth, because something that chokes out our ability to be in relationship with God. When does wealth become a problem? I mean, as I was thinking about it this week, let's take one news story that hit on Friday. We learned that our corporations, our pharmaceutical companies, decided that they would not, would not, work with other pharmaceutical companies in poor countries around the world to develop vaccines so that they could share it with those poor countries. That those poor countries couldn't make it in their area. They have to buy it from the wealthy pharmaceuticals in the developed world. That is a question of thorns, right? That is thorns rising up. Because a good that we have, something that we all need, even those pharmaceutical leaders need this. Because if everybody in the world is not vaccinated, then the virus mutates in such a way that we will always and continually be in danger. Right? And they could have done something different. They could have, like Joe Biden was able to get them to get, um, I don't know which company, one of the companies to work with Merck to create a bigger production line, right? Why couldn't they work with the equivalent Merck in these other countries? Now, we know their reasoning, right? Because they'll steal the technology and therefore they'll have it and they'll never have to rely on us again. Right? Because if they hoard it, then they can continue to make lots of money off of all the products. If they share it, they can't do that. It's a question of thorns, right? It's a question of thorns taking over something that we should all want to happen. Because if everybody in the world is not vaccinated, then we endanger ourselves and our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. Because there will be mutations that make the virus come back to us harder and stronger and worse. A question of thorns. Which gets me back to the point of, I started at. Why is it that the wealthy have less empathy? Why are they unable to experience the suffering of someone and want to do something about it. To change the circumstances that make that suffering possible. And it becomes a real question when you think about the fact that our government system, all of them, it doesn't matter what party, are multi-millionaires. All of them. 
that once they get to Congress, they may start out not multimillionaires, but through what happens as they are there, they become multimillionaires. And if it's true, scientifically, as they've studied it, that multimillionaires have less empathy, that means they have less ability to think about us and our needs. Us, the great common group of people, the majority of people in the country, they don't have the ability to experience our pain. And therefore, the decisions that they make about how our country could run don't have to do with what people need, what will make people thrive and survive and live lives that are productive and healthy and full of wonder and joy and hope, that those aren't questions that they can even see or hear because of the lure of wealth. So the disciples who are sitting there, right, have heard this encounter, have been there and watched Jesus with this man. And they watched the man leave grieving. And the disciples look at Jesus and say, what about us? We've left everything and have followed you. What about us? And Jesus says to them, as they're talking about this, he says, and this is the line everybody loves, right? It is harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a wealthy person to enter the kingdom of God. Because as another aside, Jeff Bezos could pay for everybody in the entire world to have this vaccine and it wouldn't even put a dent in the amount of money he made this year. Wouldn't make a dent. It is harder for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God than it is for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. And the disciples, of course, are like, that's impossible. What about us? And Jesus, Jesus says, nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible for God. That God can change the hearts and minds of those whose thorns have come up and surrounded them and prevented them from experiencing empathy and love, from entering the kingdom of God. God can change their feelings, their understanding. God can change their hearts and minds and their actions. For nothing is impossible for God. So what thorns do you have? What in the world right now, in your life right now, are you struggling with that is keeping you from God? What thorns have grown up around you that have caused your relationship with God to be distant, to be troubled? What thorns have surrounded you? I think right now, it is really hard for us as we struggle with what will be going forward, what the world will look like, and how we will live with all, with all the damage that has been caused to our country, the loss of businesses. And when you're in a place like that where you are losing everything, It is hard to not think about the thorns, to not think about those things that are choking you. What Jesus says is nothing is impossible for God. And if we were to put this back into the parable of the sower, even those your seeds may have been sown amongst the thorns, 
That is not the last word. That is not the end. We don't know what happens to the young man after he runs away grieving. We don't know if eventually that seed takes root. That seed takes root and grows. The pictures that I've been showing you today are from the line along the soccer fields from the elementary school to the district. Um, to the houses that are built. So as I walk my dog there, at first I just noticed that the weeds were growing and they were getting big. Like the thistle bush was over my head, okay? It is so gigantic, this thistle bush. And it starts out small, right? And as the summer grows, that thistle bush grows and grows and grows. And then in August, that thistle bush starts producing these amazing, beautiful purple flowers. Like what looks like a horrible, thorny mess becomes something full of beauty and wonder. And in some of the photos that you'll see, oh, this is one of them, see? The butterflies think this thistle is an amazing thing that those thorns do not stop them from finding the nourishment that they need. Nothing is impossible for God. No matter what your thorns are, nothing is impossible. Listen, a sower went out to sow and some of the seeds fell among the thorns and they grew up and choked out the word. Listen, Jesus looks upon you and loves you. Amen. Close your eyes and to rest in the presence of God I want you to picture Jesus and I want you to picture him looking at you and loving you Jesus, looking at him, loved him. God, where are you looking today? Who has caught your eye? Who are you seeing? Are you in the hospitals in Brazil that are close to collapse due to the overwhelming number of people with COVID-19? Are you with the one in three women experiencing violence? Are you with the undocumented Venezuelans who had their immigration status changed? Are you with the women in Switzerland who have been banned from wearing burqas? Are you with the flooding of those in Hawaii? Are you with the migratory birds returning north as protections are just at this moment being restored? Are you with those whose storefronts have been shuttered, who are left out and left behind and lost? Jesus, looking at him, loved him. God, we know you looked in all these places and many more, and you loved them. You loved him, you loved them, you loved us. Pour your love out upon us and those we have looked upon. Look upon our friends and family who are sick, who are lonely, who are welcoming new life, who are looking for work, 
who are waiting for their shop. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Continue to look and love us as we stop and say that prayer that you gave to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for all the gifts that you have been bringing. You have helped to stifle some of those thorns with the food that we have been collecting downstairs to give back to those so that they can have an Easter dinner this year. So I invite you to continue giving. I'll drop a post on Facebook this week about what we need in terms of canned goods um, after I count them all. Um, and then next week I ask you to bring us some cash if you have it. If you are able to, you can donate online or send us some money so that we can buy the hams and or chickens that are needed to feed those who come to the food pantry so that they may have an Easter dinner. So thank you for your generosity. It's getting full down there on those tables. And if nobody told you today that I love you, remember that God loves you and always will. That Jesus loves you and always will. That I love you and always will. Listen, a sower went out to sow. And sometimes those thorns get so big that they overwhelm us. But nothing is impossible for God. And those thorns can turn into flowers that feed the world. May you go out and sow the word. Amen.